They're coming. They're coming your way. They'll be here soon. Will you be ready? Well, everyone, happy Halloween. Today's the final day of Traumathon, and it's a twofer, just like the other day. Honestly, as much as I've loved working on Traumathon, I am really glad that it's over because my arms are actually killing me, and I am so ready to just take a break. It's been really a wonderful journey to be with you guys for these 31 days, and honestly, before I even start any of that, I want to thank Trey Watson for making that amazing theme song, and if you don't know him, then please click on the link down below, he will be there, and seriously, show him some love, check out his music, he's wonderful. And also thanks to Ducky3D, who I know he doesn't know I exist, but I learned most of my 3D and Blender skills from him, so really check him out as well. And of course, I could not have done this without my wonderful girlfriend who is Jelly, that is the artist of this entire channel. Uh, I really adore her and she has helped be like that rock to my world right now because I have been so mentally distraught and stressed and she has been there for me throughout this entire month. I made Dramathon to help you guys out to escape the world for at least one little month and because really I absolutely adore Halloween. Ever since I was a kid, I've been watching Halloween specials on TV and movies and all sorts of stuff. I have my Halloween traditions. I watch certain movies every single year and I make sure to be part of that spirit, you know, that has always been with me since the very beginning. Part of that tradition actually started with Monster Madness, which was hosted by Cinemassacre and created by James Rolfe. I'm sure many of you know him and of that series and I've been watching every single year. It's probably been my favorite thing to watch for, man, how long has he been doing it? For 10 or 15 years? Christ, I've been watching every single one. Unfortunately, he had to stop some way around like two years ago, I think, or three years ago. And I've been sort of yearning for something like that ever since. Uh, I mean, I also always had the two best friends play Shitstorm of Scariness, and that lasted for seven years. And that was also a wonderful thing to watch. 31 days of these wonderful videos that I absolutely adored, but of course both of these had to stop at some point. I never really thought of myself as someone who was going to carry the torch or anything, I just wanted to sort of have my own little thing happening. And really, this year was the greatest opportunity I had to ramp it up and be way better than last year's Traumathon. Last year's Traumathon was only 13 videos, and that was mainly because I didn't know what to do for the month of October. I knew I wanted to do some sort of special, but I really had no idea what exactly I wanted to do. That is until my friend Celine Necrotheo, who you guys can check out on the Twitter down below, uh, she suggested I do something called Traumathon, where I just explore things that scare the crap out of little kids kids or us when we were younger, some nostalgic stuff. And I thought that was a wonderful idea, but I didn't really know how to execute that until halfway through. And by then it was already October 15th or 16th, and I was planning to do about 15 videos, but I really stumbled it and I had no idea where to go from there. And well, I only ended up with 13 videos. This year was bigger, it was better, it was longer, and it was way more exhausting, but I do not regret it at all. This year has been scary, way scarier than any of the things that I talked about this year. Seriously, I, I know we all are avoiding that elephant or elephants in the room, and it's one thing that I wanted to do to make sure that you guys were at least sane for this month. Thankfully, nothing terrible happened this month. I mean, there are probably a few things here and there that happened in the world, but not really ground shaking. So it made October or rather Halloween more enjoyable, but that's not to say that nothing bad happened. It's just, you know, this is escapism. That's all Traumathon is. It's to help you relive something that you totally forgot or maybe something that you wanted to remember. I don't know. It's just, I don't know, I just really wanted to make this to make sure you guys were okay. I've yearned for something like this for a long time, but I knew nobody was really gonna do it. I mean, seriously, 31 videos in one month? That's fucking crazy. I mean, making one video a week is already hard. Making 31 in a month? That's 
actually insanity, but I did it. And I hope you guys enjoy. I know some of them aren't the greatest, not all of them are quality, and I definitely was lazy with some of the topics, but it, it, that just comes with the territory. It's quantity over really quality, and I hope you found at least some of them to be worth watching. Well, anyways, enough yabbering. I'm hoping I can do this for at least a few more years until eventually I get too exhausted or maybe too old to make them. But honestly, by then I'd probably be rich enough to hire a whole team to do it for me, because screw this. <laughs> honestly, doing it all by yourself is a nightmare. But to be honest, the dream is if I could be like 60 years old and still do Traumathon, bro, that would be so cool. That would be so damn awesome. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too ahead of myself. We're only on the second one. Next year, I know we'll be way bigger and way better than before. We can only go higher up from here, honestly. And I really hope, again, that you guys enjoyed it. And honestly, I, I totally forgot to mention this. Thank you to everyone who actually donated to me via PayPal or via Ko-fi. It's really weird. I never expected anyone to do this, but I've had quite a few donations from some viewers that wanted to just fund me because of Traumathon. And you know who you are. I don't really want to say your names just in case, you know, that might be incriminating. But seriously, that that is wonderful of you. And, and I, I, I am so not deserving of it. But thank you so much. I, I, I love you guys so much. And you have given me so much more than I ever asked for. I wanted to give this for you and I didn't expect anything in return. But seriously, this has really helped me, and you guys are always a wonderful part of this whole series. I, I'm getting flooded with compliments every single day. Thousands and thousands of comments, hundreds of different DMs and emails, always complimenting me on how much they love Traumathon, or they have suggestions for Traumathon, or this and that, or maybe even from previous videos that I made earlier this year, not even related to Traumathon. You guys are wonderful, and I love you guys a ton. You are awesome, and I, I cannot stress that enough. But now that Traumathon is now over, what exactly is going to happen to this channel? Well, I'm going to take a break for about a week and a half. You won't see me until somewhere halfway through November. And from there, it'll just be regular videos until December where I'll be starting out my Christmas special. And if you're not familiar with my Christmas special, essentially all I do is just look back on things that we never received, like lost media or canceled projects or games and movies that were only released in Japan or I don't know, the Middle East or somewhere else that nobody else could have gotten. It's what I always call the gifts you never got series and I hope you guys will enjoy it this year I'm planning on a few more things to do and planning on putting way more effort into this than I did last year and I'm hoping you guys will enjoy it and seriously it'll be a wonderful treat for you all and it'll be a horrible horrible workload for me again but seriously this time around it's gonna be more chill but there will be more effort put into it than last year <sighs> anyways I hope you guys enjoy please stick around there's one more video after this and uh, I guess for now, just enjoy the following recap of last year's Traumathon. It's a marathon of it all, except for that one spooky jump scare mansion thing that I did. That doesn't really count. I'm just going to leave that out. It's way too long. So just enjoy the rest of the Traumathon videos that I did all in one package so all of you can watch. It's going to be great, and I hope you like it. And uh, yeah, enjoy Halloween. Watch a good horror movie with friends or family, or read a good book, read a good horror story with a bunch of your pals, or maybe just enjoy Halloween by yourself. Honestly, there's no shame in watching other people's videos on Halloween stuff and feeling like you're a part of their world or you're immersed in their conversation. Because honestly, I know how it was like to be lonely for like four years of my life. I had no one with me at all. And watching YouTube videos was the only way I felt like I had people that I could talk to or people that I could relate with and it was a wonderful thing for me and I hope you guys feel that same way when you watch other people's Halloween content or my own who cares anyways I love you guys a ton please enjoy the content and I, I will see you guys maybe in about two weeks love you guys a ton happy Halloween I'll see you next Traumathon
remember as a kid, I used to think Resident Evil was a grown-up game, mainly because there were real guns used on real people. And I mean, sure, they were zombies, but blood shot out of them whenever you, well, shot them. But aside from the realistic aspect of the game and how it was reserved for adults only, I also remember being afraid of playing the game. It was scary. Seriously, I mean, those low-poly zombies may not seem like shit to us nowadays, but as a kid, that was the scariest thing I ever saw, and the fact that I was given control over a character whose life depended on me was just way too much responsibility, especially when I was just six years old. So, I never touched a Resident Evil game, ever. Until, of course, a few years later when Resident Evil 4 came out on the GameCube. I remember thinking, oh man, yeah, I'm totally old enough to play this. It's, it's time for me to get a big boy game with real zombies and real guns. None of this Wind Waker crap with cartoon characters. Mario's for babies. I want a real scary, horrifying, realistic game. And, and I'm going to be brave this time. And to be honest, I, I wasn't too scared of the game at all. That is, of course, till I met... Oh my god. Yeah, fuck that. I ain't playing this shit anymore. Dr. Salvador is probably the scariest enemy in any Resident Evil game, and I'd argue in any horror game in general. And I'm sure to many of you, the fact that I even said that is a cardinal sin, what with Pyramid Head and the like being considered scarier enemies. So let me make my case real quick. First off, every character you've faced up until this point has been very slow, limbering idiots. The Ganados aren't really scary, they're just stinky, smelly, brown foreigners with Ebola. Oh, sorry, I mean Las Plagas, ooh, whatever. So they're picked off like livestock, hence the name. However, fighting him is way different. Unlike the other Ganados who get stunned for a second every time you shoot them, Dr. Salvador can take multiple shots to the head and body before even reacting. Not only that, but he doesn't approach you quietly like the other villagers do. He runs at you, he charges at you with his horrifying chainsaw, which is a one-hit kill. This just a position not only makes him stand out, but it also makes him terrifying in a gameplay perspective, as the other Ganados act as a sort of locust horde that relentlessly attack you constantly and mindlessly, while Dr. Salvador needs just one shot, and he is aggressive, constantly going for you and charging at you. His simplistic design with the burlap sack on his head is effective in being scary, and the sounds his chainsaw makes immediately tenses up buttholes and has players sweating profusely. I seriously couldn't play this game for about a week until I mustered up the courage to fight him again. What makes Dr. Salvador even scarier is the fact that he's used sparingly. He's only encountered a handful of times and each encounter is spaced out far enough that you'd end up thinking he'll never show up again, but then oh shit, there he is! Though I will admit that he suffers a diminishing effect with each encounter and it doesn't help that by the end of the game you're just a walking, talking, incel soldier with guns for days, making the encounters in the end trivial. So sure. While maybe in your eyes Dr. Salvador ain't much compared to other horrifying characters in gaming, in my eyes this dude has been solidified in my deepest darkest dreams as the scariest encounter I've ever had in any game. Hell, they even tried to replicate this with a different enemy type in Resident Evil 5, but it just wasn't the same. I mean, it's not the fact that he is some weird dude with a chainsaw and a sack over his head that makes him scary, it was the idea that he was defined by those around him. Dr. Salvador never got a cutscene dedicated to him where he has a giant massive chainsaw over his head screaming like a banshee like this dude does. He was just a dude with a chainsaw that would randomly show up when you least expected him. And the chainsaw sound effect made your skin crawl instantly like, oh shit, he's still, he's, he's still dead? Like, I mean, alive? <laughs> It really makes you wonder when he's going to show up again. It's a constant fear, constant anxiety that he could be lurking around the corner somewhere deep within the caves or within the hallways, and you just won't hear him until it's too late. Honorable mention, by the way, to the Chainsaw Sisters. They were fucking nuts. Goddamn, I am never taking that route. Creepypastas are a shell of what they once used to be. Oh my god, actually, let me can I just break the mold real quick about the whole Traumathon thing? While I was researching old ass creepypastas, dude, visiting that website is horrible. There are so many ads that is, it has slowed down my browser significantly, and I swear I have viruses sneaking around the corners of my hard drive right now. That place is cancer for your fucking computer. Don't go to creepypasta.com, it is really, really bad. 
Anyways, back to Traumathon. I'm sure nowadays people still make some pretty good creepypastas out there, but for the most part, it seems that the short story horror genre has adapted to many different things. You know, you can call them creepypastas, SCPs, true stories from Reddit, ARGs, whatever. They're, they're still just creepypastas. But with the immense popularity that creepypastas have garnered, it was only a matter of time till the format was exhausted of all creativity and talent. Like I said, I'm sure there are still diamonds in the rough nowadays, but creepypastas are now more associated with memes online. Nobody takes them seriously nowadays, but back then, they were top-notch. Or, or so I thought, anyways. Yeah, actually, looking back on them now, creepypastas were never really that good. But to an edgy, pretentious teenage mind, this was golden. I assure you, though, if you actually look back on a lot of these creepypastas, especially the more well-known ones, you'll probably be shocked at how bad they were. Take for example Jeff the Killer, a story that so many people remember just for the scary image, and I won't lie, that image is terrifying, like, that shit gave all of my friends nightmares. Not me though, you know, I'm, I'm tough as fuck, uh, you know, men who wear bows are chads, you know, T take it from me. I am an orgasmic god. Oh, I, where was I? Alright, the Virgin Jeff. Reading his story is actually kind of funny, the way the story is structured feels like it was definitely written by a teenage angsty kid who doesn't really know how to write a book but thinks it's really simple and, you know, who cares, right? Authors are just nerds, they don't know how to write. I can write a better story than this Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's not even that scary. Where's the jump scares and the hyper-realistic gore and stuff? He describes the first attack, which makes Jeff the Killer seem like a ninja. <laughs> What with him lunging at his first victim, throwing his knife at his father with clean precision. It, like, it's so weird. Also, apparently Jeff talks? I never actually read this story, but seeing him talk is just so jarring because he pretty much talks exactly what I would expect an angsty teenager to sound like. He's being yelled at by his parents, he's talking back to his parents, he's not even being like, edgy. You know, he's just saying like typical teenage boy stuff that someone would say to their parents. It's like, it's so funny, like reading him talk. You know for a fact, Jeff grew up to be some incel who's watching the Joker right now thinking about how it's his manifesto or some shit. Like, that is the kind of character Jeff the Killer is and it is so fucking hilarious. But his iconic thing that makes his creepypasta so memorable is the psychotic smile. That's literally the only reason why Jeff is popular. It's because of this image, and because weeaboo teenage girls just love smiling psychotic characters with hoodies for some reason. I, I don't know. Something about a hoodie is just orgasmic for little girls. I, I just don't get it, really. Overall, Jeff the Killer is just a power fantasy story about kids who just want to kill their bullies and their shitty parents. I don't know, because there is a point where he has to kill his bullies because they have guns or something. And keep in mind, they're like 13 or 14 years old. And they have guns of pointing at his parents. And he's like, no, I'll save them. And he kills them all. Bleach goes on his face or something like that. And then he kills his parents anyway. So it's like, whatever. I, it's just, it's dumb. Please, stop. Stop fantasizing about this dumbass white kid. <laughs> Speaking of dumb attires, Slender Man, Slender Man, he'll hit you with his big old hand. <laughs> Slender Man is another edgelord creation from the creepypasta community. While his story is pretty vague, what with it just talking about this mythical cryptid that lasted for an eternity, Slender Man didn't really take off until Marble Hornets decided to run with its IP. Uh, Marble Hornets, if you're not aware of, by the way, is a web story based on the Slender Man lore. It stars Jay, a young man who's trying to find out the mystery behind Marble Hornets, which is an incomplete film shot by his friend Alex, who just never got around to finishing it. I'll talk more about that later, whenever I can in Traumathon. So just keep an eye out for that video later on. For now, all you need to know is that when the series launched, it pretty much added much more depth and horror to the Slender Man mythos. It established the whole wonky camera effect that happens whenever he's around. It grounded his identity, explains why he exists or who works for him. And it even added its own flavor into the horror mythos that made Slender Man far scarier than the original content, which was just Slender Man at his base level. However, the people behind Marble Hornets just elevated him, made more monsters and it was really well made to be honest. It basically just adds story that lacked flavor in the original. Even though the creators have stated that the monster in their story isn't actually Slender Man, yeah, right, I, that's not Slender, okay, sure. 
Speaking of people trying to save their asses from copyright, Suicide Squid... <laughs> Sorry, or Squidward Suicide... Did I say Suicide Squid? <laughs> like Suicide Squad? Alright, sure, let's run with that. <laughs> let's just run with that. Anyways, you all know the story, I'm sure. But if you don't know, let me run it down for you. Some intern at Nickelodeon somehow got this, this magical privilege of getting into the magical closet full of Spongebob episodes. I guess they needed to get there because they needed to archive an episode or something like that. Whatever, who cares? Anyways, they find Squidward's suicide and they watch it. It was a normal episode until suddenly there was hyper-realistic Squidward with hyper-realistic eyes and Squidward was hyper-realistic, so realistic, and everyone in the crowd had bloody realistic eyes and they were also hyper-real, etc, etc, you know. And then suddenly the footage just gratuitously shifts to like footage of child blank, something I can't say because it would get demonetized, and dead uh, babbies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like avoid demonetization here. Give me a break. So all this horrifying gore, hyper-realistic stuff, and blood and guts, and you know, it's just a typical SpongeBob episode, honestly. Nothing too special. Actually, interesting enough, this was the very first creepypasta I ever read, and me being the dumbass that I was, believe this to be 100% true without question. I mean, keep in mind, I think a good chunk of the audience believe creepypastas were real, mainly because we were all just dumb brats that have never actually experienced this stuff before. It was like goosebumps, but with hyper-realistic eyes and blood, and maybe made by people that we didn't even know. It wasn't just an author that had a book, it was people who were recounting their stories as if they were real life. Oh, and just so I don't get too off track here, I'm pretty sure that the Squidward suicide, the creepypasta just popularized the whole hyper-realistic eyes and blood, mainly because SpongeBob is well known for having uh, hyper-realistic shots in the show, so I'm assuming the writer of the creepypasta just made that into the scary element of the story, so when other people did the whole hyper-realistic eyes and various EXE creepypastas, it didn't really make sense because it just was comical to think a video game can be hyper realistic as if that technology exists or something like that. Speaking of which, let's get on to the EXE creepypastas. No kidding, this is my favorite format of the creepypasta genre, I guess. Something about finding a ROM hacked game that was cursed was just something that was very appealing to me, I guess because I was a gamer girl back then. Essentially, all EXE stories start off with this kid or or man baby who goes to a garage sale buying a game for nostalgic reasons or some bullshit and sometimes the garage seller would be very worried or would be a bit off as soon as they purchased the one cursed game that they didn't want them to buy even though it was clearly there like plain as day i don't know why you would want to sell it if you didn't want anybody to buy it hello anyways but then they'd come back home and then they play it normally, and then the game would talk to them, or turn off, or it would have a jump scare, or some other bullshit. You know, this leads to the kid thinking, Oh, I just saw Sonic get drenched in hyper-realistic blood, and that's weird, but I'm sure it's nothing, or something that stupid. Oh god. Oh god, it was so dumb. But I seriously loved it. Again, it was appealing to think that this could happen in, in real life, or to anyone. And when the stories were cringy, well, I benefited from that too because that gave me entertainment because it was just really fucking funny. Like the Godzilla EXE creepypasta about that one dude's dead girlfriend or whatever. God, that was so stupid. Oh my god, I loved it. Yet, yeah, throughout all the dumb shit creepypasta has provided, the one EXE creepypasta I absolutely loved was Ben Drowned. Now that's a story for another day, but man, Ben Drown lived in another world of its own. It had gameplay footage, scary storytelling, a scary lore, a pretty interactive ARG that was actually really, really fun and cool. It redefined the way we looked at the game and the way we listened to the music. It was a brilliant piece of work, and I'd argue one of the best creepypastas ever made. Seriously. Now, there's a lot I haven't mentioned. Really, really popular ones like The Rake, Harrowbrine, Laughing Jack, The, the Russian Sleep Experiment, Tiki Toby, which is something I never actually read, but I heard it's really popular, uh, Sonic.exe, you know, The Tales Doll, all sorts of other stories, but uh, to be frank, most of these stories haven't really aged well. Either some of these stories ended up being memes like Herobrine or Sonic.exe, or they're just needlessly long and boring like The Rake or Russian Sleep Experiment. 
either way, none of them have really aged well. At least in my opinion. I still love Ben Drowned, and while this one technically doesn't count, I believe username 666 is still a fantastic video. Not the shitty creepypasta, mind you. Uh, the video made by Nana, who is a fantastic horror artist and content creator. The creepypasta was made literally to ride on the success of Nana's video, but the video itself, it still holds up, and it's still really good. But that's the beauty of creepypastas. A lot of them, while the storytelling lacks in flavor or writing skills in general, a lot of them are amazing simply because of the fact of the concept. The concepts were always the creepy aspects of it, like a cursed video game, or a cursed doll, or cursed video footage, etc. Take for example Squidward Suicide. After 10 plus years of being on the internet, it finally shows up in an episode of Spongebob Squarepants. Like, it was actually acknowledged by someone in the show and was put into an episode. Let's also not forget the, the countless games that were produced that were literally inspired by creepypastas or the show Channel Zero that was based off of Candle Cove. So, sure, creepypastas, they haven't aged well. And I'll be the first to say that not everything that was inspired by creepypastas were great either. Yet the cultural impact it had on the horror genre can't be ignored. It has a massive footprint in the world of horror, and love it or hate it, creepypastas will continue to serve as the inspiration for several more projects in the future. Some good, some bad, either way, at least we got entertainment. Ocarina of Time. Considered a masterpiece by many, and yada yada yada. I don't, why, why do I even have to say that? You all know that. Why does every single gaming channel always start off like, The Legend of Zelda. One of the greatest- Like, of course, yeah, I know. Every fucking gaming YouTuber has told me that already. Thanks a lot, man. Nah, but in all honesty, it, it's a great game, dude. Like, I, I love it. I, I love it. Really, I do. Yeah, one thing that I feel is sometimes heavily underplayed is the fact that the game is really dark. Like, Seriously, I understand for many people Majora's Mask is a darker game. I know most people say that because of the apocalyptic nature of it, well, with the moon coming down in like three days, but Ocarina of Time takes place after the apocalypse. I mean, for God's sake, the first thing you see when you leave the Temple of Time after turning into an adult is a bunch of dead zo- OH MY GOD! Santa Maria Madre de Dios, rega por nosotros los pecadores ahora y no ahora. Without a doubt, one of the scariest monsters the Zelda franchise has ever had, the Reed Dead are incredibly popular in the fanbase. They've been terrorizing nightmares of many young minds since the 90s, and I, of course, being one of them. In fact, I'd say it's one of the reasons I never really beat Ocarina of Time as a kid. That, and I was stupid. I didn't really get the puzzles at all. Also, I'm not kidding about the nightmare part, by the way. I had a seriously horrifying nightmare that probably changed the brain chemistry in my mind for, like, my entire life, which I'll talk about in one of the Traumathon videos someday. The first time encountering them is probably the worst experience you'll have playing Ocarina of Time. They're just standing there, menacing. You think, oh, well, uh, this is really, really creepy. I, I better avoid this. Yeah, and then that happens, and you're suddenly latched on by this skinny looking horrifying god Mike oh my god why'd they make this thing what exactly are the re dead anyways well I mean they're zombies right hence the name re dead actually that name doesn't really make any sense like wouldn't it imply that they died again so shouldn't it be like relive I don't know I don't know, this is stupid. Why am I saying this? Yet that is a misconception. Many people believe that they are zombies, and nobody can really blame you for thinking that way. They walk like zombies, they look like zombies, they behave like zombies, only they're not zombies at all. Nah, according to Nintendo, they're just monsters conjured up by dark magic and clay. Okay, but why are they called reed deads? And also, why are so many of them in the castle town? Doesn't that imply that they maybe were citizens from seven years ago? Uh, nope, no, no, no they're, they're not. They're, they're, the people of Castletown made it out safe. The, the, they didn't die, haha. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. What about the fact that they're found under a graveyard, like, like dead bodies, you know? Surely that means, nope, uh, Ganondorf made them. He, he made them. He, he, they're guarding the sun song, yep. All right. What about the guy that says, no, no, what, what, no, they're not zombies. <laughs> so yeah, despite the overwhelming evidence of them being undead zombies, uh -oh. Red Dead aren't actually undead. 
No doubt this is in part of Nintendo trying to lower the age rating of each Zelda game from being T or above. After all, zombies are more associated with games like Resident Evil and the like, which are M-rated games, but this move is just really baffling. Canonically, undead characters already exist in the Zelda universe, and they're called Gibdos. Granted, they're not as scary as Redead, but they are mummified corpses that have been brought back from the dead. Hell, even burning off the bandages of Gibdos reveal an undead lurks underneath, which look exactly like Redead. So, what gives? Well, again, this goes back to the age rating of each game. Gibdos just aren't as graphic as Redeads are, which are just naked corpses walking around with scary-looking masks. Oh, sorry, no, they're not. They're not corpses. I'm, I'm sorry. They're clay monsters. Funny, because with each new installment, Nintendo continues to double down on this clay monster thing, even making them far more clay-like in Triforce Heroes. Still, the identity of Reed Deads remain largely unknown. Nintendo just sometimes slips up and still describe Reed Dead as undead creatures, implying that they're still zombies. So, who knows, really. Actually, no, I know. <laughs> let's just, let's be blunt about this and clear this up once and for all. Redeads, canonically and story-wise, are zombies. They are living, dead creatures. However, Redeads are also conveniently clay monsters when Nintendo wants their game to be appropriately rated. So, as scary as these guys are, I gotta be honest, with the new Zelda game coming out, I'm really hoping these guys make a reappearance. I, I mean, come on, the game takes place underground with the corpse of Ganondorf just chilling there at the bottom of Hyrule. How can you not have zombies in this game? Oh, wait, no, sorry. No, I, I mean clay monsters. Wait, hang on, I mean clay monsters. All right, so this one's a personal one, I'll admit. Not a lot of people will probably be as scared as I was when I was a kid meeting this character, but eh, I'll still talk about it. So you might disagree with me on this, but I consider Metroid Fusion to be a light survival horror game. I know, kind of weird, but really think about it. You're alone, isolated from the outside world, you never once meet anyone in the game, not a, not a single soul. Literally, there is no NPCs in this game whatsoever. There are these horrifying creatures that lurk around every corner, bosses that stalk you, terrifying monster designs, and a limited resource of skills and ammos, plus parasites that copy and control things that have died on this space station, essentially making it so that you're literally fighting zombies. And all the while, you have your very own nemesis. Literally, this is just pretty much a Resident Evil clone, let's let's be real here. Now granted, there's a lot of things about Metro Fusion that really aren't survival horror-esque, but that's why I consider it a light survival horror. Diet survival horror. It's unsettling, but the things that make the game terrifying the most is SAX, or Sax as I used to call her. Samus is no stranger to doppelgangers, but SAX is on another level entirely compared to Dark Samus. She's an ex-parasite that replicated Samus' skill set, weapons, armor, and upgrades when she was first infected by this parasite. The implication is that this was the virus that almost killed Samus Aran, and now it's back to finish the job. Goddamn, I love it, but also I hated SAX. She was incredibly overpowered, and mainly because she had all the moves you wanted to get in the first place, or at least attempted to get. While SAX doesn't actually hunt you down, the encounters are sparse enough to make you fear every meeting with her. It was already implied that she was much stronger than you simply because she was the reason you became significantly weaker story-wise, and that creepy image of SAX looking down into the camera that was, that was nightmare fuel, and it still is to this day. Not only that, but the music that plays when she's around and the heavy footsteps that you hear when she's approaching you in the hallway. That is just anxiety fuel, man. It is really, really well done. The sound design, everything about Metro Fusion is very well done, but especially the encounters with SAX. And to be honest, there are other very scary creatures in there. And I know you guys are going to mention Nightmare, who is also pretty scary. And since because this episode is going to be short anyways, I might as well mention Nightmare. Nightmare is essentially Essentially this bio-engineered creature that had failed. Just like every other bio-engineered weapon, this one was out to kill everything that it saw. Nightmare has this incredible introduction into his character, or rather the boss fight itself, wherein you, you first went to the Arctic region in Metro Fusion, you would see shadows constantly passing by, and very, very briefly, you would hear this very low humming sound. You couldn't quite catch what it was, but you could always see it, you could feel 
feel it, you could hear it. The shaking effect made it feel like this was an enormous creature, and you would soon realize that he was really big. And while you were dreading the fact that there was something lurking in the shadow, something literally making the ground shake, there is a sudden pause, a sudden relief. This this one room where nothing is happening, and then... Emergency in Sector 3. All of a sudden, it's just an emergency. Something's happening in Sector 3, and it's just chaos, and you're like, holy crap, your mind is totally off of it, and you might even completely forget that you just encountered some weird creature in Sector 5. But then, of course, you have to go back to Sector 5 because you were told that there is massive damage being dealt, and that is when you realize that it is being caused by Nightmare, who has completely altered the entirety of Sector 5, making it a brand new level, essentially. You're then given the objective to go out there and eliminate him. That's when you get the very first glimpse of him. You see this giant, ominous-looking figure that is eerily floating in the air, and the more you damage Nightmare, the more pus and this disgusting-looking ooze comes out of his eyes. Shoot at him more, and then you'll reveal this horrifying-looking, disgusting, malformed face. It's just something out of a, well, Nightmare. And he is just so... God, he's so cool, but really gross and goddamn I hated fighting him as a kid. That was a scary motherfucker. But let's not downplay SAX. She was really creepy as well. And really all of this entire game, like there are so many parts of it that really freaked me out as a kid. But those are the only two that really stand out. And I guess I'll just leave you with this one thing that I thought of when I was a kid. If that's how creepy SAX looked behind the helmet, then, what does she look like without the entirety of her armor? Is there anything there? Is it just flesh? What exactly lies beneath that power suit? I've always wondered that. And honestly, I don't really want to find out. Welcome to tonight's episode of Traumathon. Tonight, I thought it'd be a little different. Uh, I've been doing a lot of media-related stuff, mostly video game-related stuff. But I think tonight, I want to tell you about a nightmare that I had when I was a kid. Now, if you haven't already seen it, I made a video about the Re-Deads. And I mentioned very briefly how that was the cause of one of the worst nightmares I ever had as a kid. Uh, and I'm not joking about that. I really did have a very traumatic, horrible nightmare. And while I may hype it up to you, it might seem a little silly... But to me, it remains as one of the worst nightmares I've ever had. And that's what I want to tell you about tonight. Tonight's episode is about that nightmare and my recollection of what had happened in it. Within this nightmare, I started out by just playing with toy cars and other sort of action figures that I had. Power Ranger stuff, Transformers, you know, stuff that little boys like in the 90s. I was in my apartment living room with my mother, who was currently ironing a bunch of clothes of ours. I believe she was getting ready for church, and she would always do this. She would iron my father's clothes, my brother's clothes, my clothes, etc. In the living room, there was a door, and it was right behind me while I was playing with my little toys. I didn't really think much of it, I was just more distracted by the toys that I was playing with. And then suddenly, it just opened by itself. And I had noticed that it was opening slowly, inviting a cold air within the living room, one that had not been there before, changing the atmosphere, one that was more warm and inviting to something more chilling and sinister. And that's when my mother had to go to the kitchen, which was right around the corner. While she was moving past me, she had accidentally kicked one of my toys towards the door. And as it went inside the cold, dark, unknown room, I heard a clanking sound. The toy was descending. And that's when I opened the door to fetch my toy. It's when I saw these stone creatures that were living within the basement of our home. Now these stone beings, they didn't move at all. They were just people, in fact. People who had horrified expressions on their faces and had seemingly turned to stone somehow. They were all surrounding my washing machine. There was maybe about a few dozen of them down below. Somehow, however, 
My toy had landed on top of the washing machine that they had all surrounded. There was a very thick, invisible fog that was crawling alongside the floor. I tried to call my mom for help to get my toy back, but she didn't respond. In fact, I don't even think she was there anymore. I really wanted my toy back, and I didn't really think much of the stone figures other than the fact that they were kind of creepy. So I had descended down the stairs very carefully because I felt like there was something strange about them, something I didn't really quite know about, but something that I knew I shouldn't have disturbed. I was walking down the stairs, and it was then that I knew just instinctively that I couldn't have touched the floor, like the very floor of the basement. There was something about it that just made me not want to touch the floor at all. It, it kind of told me instinctively that if I had touched it, I might have turned into one of the stone creatures that were down there. So I stood up on the handrail and I tried to jump at my toy, surrounded by all these stone people. I leapt forward and I actually landed on the washing machine and I got my toy back. I was relieved and I really wanted to get back up, but without thinking, I actually stood on the floor, and as soon as my foot touched the ground, all the statues started moving, and they looked directly at me. The ones that were covering their faces revealed that underneath their hands were just nothing, no faces whatsoever. Some of them just had mouths, others were missing eyes. The ones with mouths had screaming expressions, the one with eyes looked like they were about to cry, and the ones that had no face started to approach me slowly. I tried to move away and I was panicking. I tried to run, however my legs were already stone. I tried to budge but every movement that I made was pointless because more of my body began to turn to stone and I looked up, screamed, yelled, hoped that my mother could hear me but nothing, nothing responded. But just as I was about to lose hope I saw her, my mother was there. She was doing the same thing that I saw her doing in the beginning. She was ironing her clothes. And through the crack of the door, I was able to scream out, begging for my mother to save me. But the door started to close slowly. And I screamed and I screamed. I reached out to her. And as my arms pointed forward, they instantly turned to stone. And I couldn't move. I screamed out crying. And my face was petrified. There was a grasp like that of hands around my throat. I soon realized that my throat had turned to stone. I could not scream anymore. I couldn't even see anymore. Through my eyes, all I saw was darkness, but I could still feel a little bit of my face left. But that feeling soon dissolved as the rest of my body turned to stone. The rest of the dream was just darkness. I heard nothing except for the door closing. For as long as there's been media, there's been piracy, and with piracy often being an issue for most distributors and developers, they've often found ways to counter pirates from stealing their games with anti-piracy measures. Some anti-piracy strategies are clever, like Gmod's method of crashing your game and giving you a string of numbers that, when you submit in the forums, pretty much outs you out as a pirate. Some are funny, like how in Game Dev Tycoon, they have a method where they just literally make the game unbeatable because of rampant growth the piracy of your game, making your company just go bang up and others of course are just really creepy as hell unfortunately i had a really hard time finding creepy anti-piracy examples in games but real quick i, I want to roll through some honorable mentions and if you're here for a cuphead then just skip to this timestamp Okay, first one up is from Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Apparently, nobody in the world hates pirates more than Game Freak, because if you illegally download the game, the ferryman next to the SS Anne, after accepting your ticket, will immediately tell you to buy the real version of the game or die. Considering the majority of the people playing this game were probably all children, this would have really scared some jackass kids from stealing games. Actually, real quick update, apparently this might have been a hoax. Uh, there's no real evidence of it actually happening in a pirated game, but I don't know, I haven't seen it disproven either so it's up in the air honestly just take it with a grain of salt next up is from the spanish dos game called la abadia de crimen which is a game with a cult following about a monk trying to solve a mystery of the disappearance of another monk which was based off of a best-selling book the name of the rose and has an interesting anti-piracy measure that replaces the ava maria song that was supposed to be playing here
saying pirata over and over again, which means pirate. Every time he says it, the word gets slower and slower and sounds way more demonic. Wow, I would shit my pants. And finally, Five Nights at Freddy's little anti-piracy thing. Guess what happens when you have a pirated version? You get jump scared. Wow. Never would have saw that coming. Alright, on to the main entry. Well, Cuphead and his pal Mugman, they like to roll the dice. By chance they came on Devil's Game, and gosh, they paid the price. Paid the price. Wow. Who would have thought that this game had the scariest anti-piracy method ever made? No, seriously, it's pretty bad. But I suppose that's to be expected from a game based off of the rubber hose era of cartoons. See, back then, cartoons never really held back punches and would often have spooky imagery of Satanism and violence in the cartoons. It wasn't really because the creators were like Satanist or evil or anything. It's just cartoons really didn't have any sort of restrictions and they were made for adults back then. So, you know, whatever. But the dudes over at MDHR Studios took a step further with their anti-piracy song that can be heard on the title screen when the game detects you're playing an illegal copy of the game. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fucked. It actually gets even creepier when you run the audio through a spectrogram, which reveals the devil is hidden within the audio of the song. Further enhancing the spooky satanic symphony is the file name, which contains the number 666. So, yeah, that's haunting. But apparently, this piracy prevention file was only added to the game after a few months after the game was initially released. So if you're one of the bastards that decided to pirate the game when it first launched, chances are you never actually saw or heard this easter egg at slash anti-piracy song. This would explain why some people online have claimed to have never heard the song before. So that's cool and all, but creepier still is this alleged rumor of this jump scare hidden away in King Dice's room. See, before you move on to different worlds, King Dice has to make sure you have all of the contracts in order for you to move on. Normally, you'd get this amazing little song sung by Alana Bridgewater, but allegedly in the pirated version, you actually start hearing something ticking in the background. You're not really sure what it is, and apparently you can't leave the die house. The ticking begins to get faster and faster, till eventually the ticking stops, and then... Well, no, not exactly that, but allegedly you do get jump scared by King Dice himself. Once this happens, you're kicked out of the game and you're trapped in the title screen forever. Again, these are just allegations made by one dude on Reddit that began to spread everywhere. There's no real evidence of this happening ever, and the guy who posted this on Reddit was very reluctant in showing footage. He was also dodging a lot of questions and just ended up disappearing from Reddit, honestly. I personally tried getting the pirated version of the game, but I have yet to find this specific updated version with the song. I was able to find a pirated version, but this was the one before they added the pirated music. And before I get called out for pirating, don't worry, I already bought the game on Steam, I'm just trying to fulfill a curiosity. But if anyone out there wants to find this supposed jump scare, then please let me know if you ever find it. As of right now, well... It's just a rumor and probably not even real. Though I can say that those songs that you hear in the title screen are real and that spectrogram is real as hell. So regardless of that, this is still one of the scariest anti-piracy measures I've ever seen. 
Here's another strange, obscure fear of mine. The ocean. Now I'm not just talking about like any ocean. However, I I'm really just talking about video game oceans. Yeah, I don't know if I'm like part of a collective niche here or maybe I'm just the only one who feels like this, but I really hate video game oceans and any sort of deep sea levels. It's not that I'm afraid of large bodies of water. Oh, I was holding the mic the wrong way. I'm sorry about that. It's not that I'm afraid of large bodies of water, nor am I afraid of the ocean in real life. In actuality, I think life in the ocean, the marine life, is just very fascinating, and I really do love swimming. When it comes to virtual oceans, however, yeah, then my anxiety starts to kick in, especially when it comes to games with open world. And honestly, why shouldn't I fear the ocean in games? Sometimes developers hide some scary shit, like for example in Wind Waker, which is a game that's nothing but vast oceans and open seas, and I'm assuming the one game that actually kicked off this anxiety of mine. It's very cheery and actually pretty exciting to explore out in the ocean and discovering uncharted islands, yet things start to shift quickly when you encounter this bullshit. Yeah, out of nowhere, the clouds just turn gray and you're stuck in this whirlpool with this horrifying giant squid. Or like when you end up finding the ghost ship on accident. That was both the scariest and coolest thing I saw as a kid. Seriously, I was both mystified by the fact that I got to see the ghost ship that everyone keeps talking about in Windfall and horrified to see that it actually exists. Stuff like that always seems to appear in games and it's often pretty scary when you're not expecting it. Another more recent example is a World of Warcraft. I don't know if you guys are aware, but WoW has some of the scariest oceans in any game, and it might just be because of my own niche fears, but I just don't like the idea that there is literally nothing beyond those oceans. It is just nothingness for the, as far as the eye can see. Sure, there are things lurking deep within the ocean, and oh my god, you can find some really scary things down there. But the idea of the vastness beyond the sea, like the fact that the end of the world is literally at the end of those oceans, just creep me the fuck out. It's like when I found out Outland was literally beyond Eversong Woods. I got this odd irrational fear of being on the edge of the ocean, let alone diving deep into the vast darkness, which already terrifies me in its own right. But then more discoveries were made that things that lurked in the ocean, like the, the portal that exists below Azshara before Cataclysm, something about that existing underneath always scared me. Or that really creepy abandoned island that's just south of Tenaris, and it's just eerie whenever there, there's content within a game that has just been left abandoned by the programmers, either because they forgot or because they're going to get back to it soon, but most likely, it's just literally abandoned. Honestly, I could do a whole list on WoW things and the creepy shit that they've left behind or they purposely left in, but I really want to focus on the Leviathan that lurks below the oceans of Stormsong Valley. He's nearby two places. One, where he's just chilling in the middle of the lake of Stormsong and he's just like next to a boat, and another that can be summoned with a horn beneath the ocean in this one secret underwater shop. I fucking hate it. Uh, this this is like I hate it. It's it is like in a dark ocean. It it has tentacles. I don't want. I don't know. I don't want it, man. I don't. See, this is the kind of crap that makes me hate underwater exploration in games, and it surprises me that it's not explored more in video games. Only game I can really think of that takes place underwater and has some horror aspects to it is Bioshock and Soma. And Bioshock doesn't really even count, seeing as how it's more like action oriented than Soma, which is like psychological terror. But I don't really want to actually talk about real horror games being underwater. What's creepier to me is the games that aren't intended to be creepy and have underwater levels, like Mario, for example. In Mario Sunshine, you got this one mission, or I don't know, what is it called the mission? I don't know. Anyways, you would go underneath and you would find this giant ass eel, this, oh my god, this horrible thing that lurks deep, dark, oh, no, yeah, fuck, I, I don't want to get that shine anymore. Fuck the 100% completion rate, fuck that. It's almost like the developer saw like how much liters of piss like people were producing every day they would see that damn eel in Jolly Roger Bay and they thought to themselves oh hey that was funny let's do that again sometimes I got so scared of that eel by the way that I'd spend more time running away from him and less time getting air resulting in this horror show it's oh my god he's fucking like Mario is legit he legit is dead he just died he's dead goodbye Mario's dead 
Actually, while we're on the topic, can someone for the love of God please tell me why every video game character drowns the worst way possible? You see Mario falling in lava and singeing his tight little asshole, getting electrocuted, showing off his little skeleton, but the moment the dude loses oxygen in water, the fucker dies IRL. He's dead. It's not just Mario. Liter literally everyone drowns a horrible way. The worst one being Conker, and I understand Conker is an M-rated game, but seeing him drown in the game is just excruciatingly painful. His other deaths are violent, sure, but they're more akin to like Tom and Jerry kind of deaths, you know, if Tom and Jerry had blood in it. I, I guess more like South Park, you know? But watching him drown is so uncomfortable. So be you a horror game that takes place completely underwater, or just a regular video game with an underwater level that has something lurking beyond the dark, deep depths of your dumb game, just know that I'll always hate your game forever, no matter what, you fucking scumbags. Curse the Cowardly Dog was a mystifying little show because it somehow balanced humor with horror. And not to say that the entire show is like some horror fest that nobody could ever watch. Of course, it has a few creepy moments, but it's not actually stupidly scary, right? Maybe not to an adult, but to us kids, we were terrified of some of the things here, and I saw a lot of you recommend several aspects of the show, and it was really hard to narrow down some experiences that you had and myself, and see which one really was the scariest moment of them all, but instead of competing against every single one, I would rather go through just a few moments that actually impacted us as kids, the ones that were really, really terrifying. Starting off with a real popular one, Return the slab. What? Return the slab. Or suffer my curse. See, this is scary on multiple levels. Not only is the voice and the repeating return the slab very haunting, but it's also the way he's animated. They made him very much surreal. They made his look, the way he moves, very unnerving. And it works out in this episode's advantage. But of course, there are some pretty humorous moments, including the mummy, especially that one part where he's like, Oh, come on. I always thought that was hilarious, and that really broke the mold for me. I, I didn't think he was scary after that. Regardless, to many of us, he was horrifying, and it, it, we really avoided that episode whenever possible. But no episode was more avoided by me personally than this one that featured this horrifying looking dude that was just... That is so... That is bad. Now you're just being mean to kids. Essentially what the episode was about was that Eustace had to grow some crops, whereas he claimed that he had a green thumb. In reality, he didn't grow anything. This angers the spirit of the Harvest Moon for disrespecting his land and, and not growing any crops for the harvest. This causes him to appear and it, it, is, it is so... I, words really can't describe how horrifying this creature is. Like, they were really trying to make kids shit their pants. This was mean. This was cruel. This was horrifying. Not only that, but his voice was also pretty bad. What with the whispery way that he talked. Though I'll be honest, rewatching the episode, he's pretty silly. <laughs> he, he doesn't really say anything ominous. He doesn't really have a foreboding uh, air about him. Like, he does have a spell that he casts upon them all that basically makes them all melt and in this horrible heat. But honestly, he's really kind of silly. <laughs> He also makes a very brief appearance as opposed to the mummy that was uh, asking for his slab back. But speaking of brief appearances and very effective ones at that, this thing. I really can't explain what it is, and I can't explain either what makes it so terrifying. But I remember as a kid that it was the single most horrifying thing I saw in a kid's cartoon. It really was. It, that's, that's no exaggeration. I actually remember having a nightmare 
featuring him like three nights in a row ever since I saw him. Now, there's nothing about him that's really too scary. There, Like if you were to talk character design 101, he's really not the top charts of like spookiness, but it's just the way he whispers out. It's this haunting message that will always be with you. You are not perfect. You will never be perfect. And maybe I'm exaggerating with the way I am interpreting the monster. It is a kid's cartoon after all, but this is something that affects you for a lifetime. And that monster, that thing, that dream, that nightmare that tells you that you are not perfect. It is the one thing that always reminds you of your humanity, your imperfection. You're everything and, and and there's just so much about it that is just so awesome honestly as scary as he is it is amazing how effective his appearance is also shout out to this guy for introducing me to psychological horror <laughs> but diving deeper into the aspects of different kinds of horror there is that episode that featured this masked character who spoiler alert we find out is related to this other character who is known as bunny bunny is in an abusive relationship with this dog that pretty much is just as bad as it sounds. While the show is still for kids, they definitely try their best to emulate what an abusive relationship is for children. And it is graphic in a sense, especially if you're a part of this kind of relationship. If you've been influenced by this kind of stuff, you will see how this will affect you. And it's not horror in the aspect that, okay, she's wearing a scary mask, sure. But it's more horror in the sense that this is just real people. I mean, they're animals, sure, but this is just how it happens. This is life. Sometimes people are abusive and they can't leave. They can't escape from the reality that they are stuck in. But thankfully, they do escape, and it's a happy ending. It is kind of a shame, though, that they couldn't actually, you know, be a couple at the end. They have to be best friends forever at the end. I know that if it were made today, they would actually be a couple that would totally kiss on TV. But hey, you know what? You get what you get. And finally, one that I personally don't find scary, but you guys seem to find scary, is the episode with Freaky Fred. Do you know how close I was to saying Freddy Freaker? I was seriously about to call him Freaky Freaker. So Freaky Fred is a freaky barber who does freaky things with hair, <laughs> or rather the removal of hair. Now, this isn't really too scary to me, but I do understand that for some people, it made people feel very, very uncomfortable. I actually had a lot of friends when I was a little boy that really hated this episode because it scared the crap out of them. But for me, I, I thought it was very whimsical. I thought it was very charming, if not fetishistic. I mean, that's what this entire episode is. It's just one dude talking about how his fetish just took over his entire life and how he has done horrible fetishistic things to other people for the sake of his own pleasure. It is very uncomfortable when you understand that connotation as an adult. But as a kid, I, I, I thought it was like, oh, this is a really cool like Dr. Seuss episode. I love episodes that just like rhyme and limericks. It's, it's just awesome. It's, it's nice. But like now I watch it and there is definitely some underlying sexual themes with everything. Or maybe you disagree, but I think understanding that part of it, thinking of it as like his fetish being uh, the thing that takes over his life, that is scarier to me than just Freaky Fred having a freaky design. I, I think that is the thing that truly makes him horrifying. Also, while I'm at it, uh, a huge shout out to the Freaky Fred reanimated collaboration that was just made. It is amazing. It is completely well done. And it has just a bunch of incredibly talented artists under the hood. And it is fantastic. Just watch it. I, I can't I can't like celebrate it enough. It, it is wonderful. Curse the Cowardly Dog will forever be cemented in our minds as that one freaky show that we loved. But not just because of the fact that it was horror. Sure, for many of us, it introduced us to the world of horror and how we can uh, explore that even further. But for many of us, it was a charming little show. It was more than just Tom and Jerry-esque antics or screaming faces, screaming courage. It was more than that. Sometimes it was a touching show that had an incredible lesson to, to teach. And it was also one of those shows that could make you feel more than just fear. It could make you feel happy. It could make you laugh. And it could just make you feel really good inside.
Invader Zim is a legendary show amongst the folks over at Hot Topic. It's that one show that you always see that green little gerbil sprouting out random shit all the time, and it's part of the reason why you were seen emo bitch baby as a kid. Yes, yeah, it's that show. Not nah, but for real though, it's a great show. I don't know. Well, I mean, what what else should I say? I feel like everyone already gave like their three hour long reviews on what made it a quote unquote masterpiece. So I'm not really going to waste my time regurgitating the same amount of shit that everyone's already said. I just thought it was a funny show and, and had a very cynical and dark sense of humor that was just a breath of fresh air. The unique factor of Invader Zim was the fact that it was a black comedy for kids. It was edgy and not in the overused sense of the word of like we live in a society. I, I mean, like they were making jokes that were literally on the cusp of being censored out like one of the worst episodes and by that i mean like the darkest involves zim actually harvesting kids organs just so he could seem more human making his body grotesque and bursting with intestines literally yeah th that was like some dark shit and it played out like a horror movie what with dib being chased around by zim halfway through the episode with zim hiding in the shadows and the cooing of the pigeon signifying how close he was to getting dib. That's pretty scary in itself, I'll admit. But the real thing that made Invader Zim creepy to me, at least, was when I learned about Bloody Gur. See, Bloody Gur was this little inside joke amongst the creators of the show because he was supposed to show up in one of the episodes. Now, there's no real context as to when or why Gur was supposed to show up bloodied, but again, Zim was harvesting organs for Christ's sake. Like, why wouldn't Bloody Gur just be a thing, seriously? Although when Jonin Vasquez submitted the idea to Nickelodeon, they promptly denied his request. But the drawing of Gur bloodied up still exists within the episode, despite rejection. See, because director Steve Russell actually snuck in several bloody Gurs throughout the show in just one single frame. The most notable and famous example of bloody Gur showing up was in the episode Bad Bad Rubber Piggy. During the episode, Zim creates a time machine to get rid of Dib. At first, he has this giant mech to send back in time to kill him, but Gur throws a rubber piggy instead. This actually benefits Zim as it makes Dib's life incredibly miserable, and the more rubber piggies he threw into the time machine, the more it was causing several horrible accidents to happen in his life. During one of the times that they threw a pig, Bloody Gur faintly shows up in the portal at the very center. It's very faint, but he is there. This little scene scared and fascinated a ton of kids at the time, at least the ones who were paying attention. And when word broke out that the staff snuck in several Bloody Gurs all over the show, the search continued onwards. Although as cool as it is to know that several of these Bloody Gurs exist, specifically 14 or so, it was real scary to me as a child. and I think to a few other kids as well who were fans of the show. I knew this because I talked to my friends about it when I was a kid, and they said it creeped them out too. Hell, I, I still get some people telling me that Bloody Gur is a creepy little easter egg. It didn't really make us stop watching the show, nor was it really that terrifying that we just couldn't see it anymore or whatever, but the idea of Bloody Gur existing in one of the shows we love so much and that he's just hiding right there in front of our faces is just kind of scary, don't you think? Not to mention that the image of Bloody Gur isn't really that friendly either, nor is it really even that funny. It's just a deadpan Gur with blood all over his body. It's eerie, honestly, and it's not like it's ketchup or or some other substance, it's literally blood. It's especially scary when you consider that Gur is the weirdo, funny character that always lightens up the mood, if not annoys the crap out of the audience, yet here he is, just staring at you with blood all over his head and his torso it's it's unsettling to say the least now as far as we know there's only two known sightings of bloody Gur: the aforementioned bad bad rubber piggy episode and the episode mortos their soul stealer that's hard to say for some reason which is far clearer than the former's appearance he can be seen in the intro of the show again as a single frame a lot of people believe that this was the reason why invader zim got cancelled but in reality nickelonia never actually found out about it until after the show's cancellation and when they inevitably did find out 
they really weren't that bothered, honestly. So if that's the case, then it's very likely that Bloody Gur still exists in Invader Zim and has not been edited out in future releases. In fact, I can prove that this is the case since I've already seen Bloody Gur in Bad Bad Rubber Piggy on Hulu, which is where you can stream the episodes now. Going frame by frame during that one part of the episode revealed that Bloody Gur still exists even today. Again, it's, it's very, very faint, but he is there. But again, only two out of the potential 14 have been found. So if you got time to spare and patience to go by frame by frame every single Invader Zim episode, then by all means, go on ahead. But be warned, these bloody Gur sightings haven't ever been found in like 13 years. So you're definitely got your works cut out for you, especially when you consider that the director and the, the producer behind this stuff actually revealed where these things are, where these sightings are. And yet people still haven't found them. It's a difficult like Easter egg hunt to say the least. So good luck to all y'all. I don't think I speak for myself saying that this is the movie that made me hate dolls. Like, legit hate dolls. See, I had a sister, and I'm sure many of you did, or maybe a brother for some reason, that collected a bunch of dolls, a bunch of action figures, and they all had these dead eyes on them that just looked and stared blankly off across the room, and they were just so unsettling. Something about them made me really hate dolls and they just oh they were so ugly and horrifying especially when it was dark at night and you had to get something from your room but you know that your sister's room is literally open and you can see that that horrible barbie doll is just staring at you with those blank eyes while nothing emphasized my fear for dolls and, and that kind of shit than chucky and i think for all of us it started there. See, for you kids who had grown up with Freddy Fazbear and his five crazy nights, we grew up with something called Chucky, and I'm sure you have grown up with it too, but for the most part, we uh, are heavily influenced by our fear of dolls because of Chucky. Chucky had this horrifying little design that seemed very friendly, child-friendly, whatever, but then as the movie progressed, he becomes this villainous, murderous doll. And you know something? I remember watching it as a kid and being just horrified of the doll for no real reason. Honestly, he didn't do anything that scary. And re-watching it now, I think I think Chucky isn't really that scary. In fact, he's really, really funny. I said talk to me, damn it! Alright. Make you talk. Talk to me, damn it, or else I'm gonna throw you in the fire! You stupid bitch, you filthy slut! Did you fuck with me? Brad Dorif played the character so incredibly well, and his yells and his screams, his performance was magical. It was amazing to watch, but the little doll running around, it was kind of ridiculous. There were definitely some horror aspects that made it a great horror movie in itself, but as a kid, I can't explain it. I really can't explain it. It was just the smile on him, the fact that a doll could come to life and murder me and can kill me. It was the complete opposite of Toy Story and I grew up more with Toy Story than I did with Chucky but the idea like what if Toy Story went wrong and they just started murdering me they stared at me and even with the toys that I had like for example I had a Woody doll actually I would hate the idea of him staring at me so sometimes I would just put him away in a box because I just I I, I didn't like the eyes of dolls they, they were just so uncanny to me and I'm not speaking for myself, I'm sure many of you felt the same way. There was this unexplained fear with Chucky the doll, and there were so many sequels to that movie, so we could never really escape the horror that was Chucky. But again, as an adult, reviewing it, rewatching it, it's nothing really. It's nothing too scary. It is a great movie to watch, at least for the first time. The next few times, not so much. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with Chucky, or at least Child's Play as a franchise, let me explain real briefly what it is. Okay, it's actually really dumb reading the synopsis, it's really fucking dumb, but 
I'll try and say it with a straight face. So essentially, there's this criminal, horrible criminal, does a lot of bad shit, whatever. He gets shot out by the cops in the very beginning of the movie. And it's here, during his dying breath, he summons this god or he does this little ritual with the voodoo gods where he replaces his soul with that of a doll. So now his soul is no longer within the husk of his human uh, form it is now within this doll and it's there that he infiltrates this uh, home that belongs to this loving family of, of a single mother and her child and of course she wants to just see her child happy and seeing how the child really just wants a good guy doll which the one she gets just so happens to be notorious villain by the name of Charles Lee Ray of course she's none the wiser and while her son Andy plays with the new doll, there are violent incidents that happen within the home that is at first thought to be by Andy, but of course we soon find out that it is the doll that is causing all the crime. And I feel like that's the weak part of the entire movie. Like, I, I wish we hadn't been told that Chucky was a doll that was committing mass murder. Like, the very beginning tells us, yes, this is the murderer. He put his soul in the, it's weird. I kind of wish that there was more subtlety to it. I, 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 there are many shots in the movie that makes it kind of suggest that maybe it's Andy that's committing all the crimes and he's just a demonic child that likes to murder people. But it flat out already explains that Chucky is the main villain. I think even in the trailers it explains that there could be this duality between Andy and the doll. He's blaming the doll for all the murders, but obviously that's not the case. We all know that it's Chucky. I mean, for Christ's sake, we, we all know already in the movie. Like, hindsight is 2020 already. I mean, seriously. But as goofy as it is and how poorly struck it is I still appreciate the movie for when it came out you see during the late 80s early 90s there was this craze for action figures and dolls for kids and it was just everywhere everyone wanted a doll like you hear about those tickle me elmos that just like sold out well take those tickle me elmos and amplify it by like a thousand and that was happening all the time around the Christmas season man people died for some of these dolls that craze helped inspire this movie and it sort of parodies and kind of commentates on the sort of obsession we have over these plastic things for our kids. So despite its flaws, I still watch this movie every now and again because I still think it's pretty good. And to be honest, that scene where Chucky is burned alive and all that's left is just this black tar skeleton. Oh God, that is so good. And man, I hated watching that as a kid. Oh man, I hated it. Hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's final potentially final Traumathon video of the season. This one is, well, featuring all of you. I asked on my community tab uh, for any scary stories, and I wanted to, sh to just hear out what you guys had to say, and I want to share these stories with everyone else, and I will be narrating them, almost all of them. I mean, there was over a hundred submissions, so I really couldn't get to all of them. And I'm really sorry, because I really did want to do almost all of them, but I, I couldn't. It was too ambitious, and it would never have been made. But for those of you who submitted it, and for those of you who have your stories currently being read by me, I thank you so much for the content that you have provided to all the fans of this community. And with that being said, please enjoy tonight's stories. I love you all so much. Good night. When I attended my former university, University of Notre Dame, I was one day sitting in the common area of my dorm's floor, watching TV and doing homework. On my right, out of the corner of my eye, I could see people walk by, and on my left, I would see their reflections in the window as they walked by. I was just chilling there for a while. And out of the corner of my left eye, I saw someone walk outside the window towards the direction our gym was. It was surely not a reflection, and the dude was wearing a suit. I didn't think anything of it for a few seconds until I realized, wait a minute, I'm on the third floor. It freaked me out, as I was sure I saw someone, so I promptly went to bed. A couple of weeks later, I was scrolling through my dorm's Facebook page and saw a new article about someone who had passed away the day before their graduation. 
Apparently he lived on the same floor as I, and even occupied the room next door to mine. With how many dorms there are on the campus, it wasn't a coincidence. I swore it was him I saw. I went back to my hometown theater with a friend who's never been there. They're doing renovations, and while watching our movie, we both saw a silhouetted man in the booth with a projector. But most of the time, there wasn't anything up there. It was fine until the end, where we realized no one had been controlling the camera. It was automatic. After that, we were talking about it while using the bathroom, and I see a black form from the corner of my eye in the stalls. Whenever I looked, though, nothing was there. My friend had left, and noises started coming from the stall end of the public bathroom. I see the blob figure more frequently from the corner of my eye, and I'm drying my hands when I hear it, feel it, walk up to me. It swiped at my coat. I finished up and ran out to tell my friend. In short, it was a good birthday. I was around six years old. I was late for music class. You see, my school was a middle school on one half of the building, but a preschool on the other. And for some reason, our preschool music class was at a middle school part of the building, and that means it takes a while for me to get there. Everyone had already went in, and I was going in by myself when suddenly I stopped. On the end of the hallway, I saw a gray naked child with black eyes and black hair. I wasn't scared as a kid. I was just confused. What is it? Is it a ghost? I couldn't understand and I didn't want to approach it. I just went back from where I came and skipped class. Over the years I had dreams with him, but I know it's probably just my brain, not a ghost. In my dreams he would try to scare me or drag me to my basement, though there was this one weird dream where I was doing house chores and out of nowhere he walked up to me and just said, Rich, and it ended there. I haven't ever seen him again apart from that, and I kind of want to see him right now. I'm not sure of the existence of ghosts, and I'm split between them being real or fake. The only other weird paranormal story I have is this. I was asleep and dreaming. The dream had a few of my friends talking. Suddenly, one of them jokes about putting me in a demon hole. The word demon echoes heavily in my mind, and I wake up. I don't know how or why, but I sense something standing in my doorway. This wave of fear swallows my whole body, and I don't want to move. I'm too scared to move. I'm panicking in my mind, and I decide to do that thing where you pretend to sleep, but like lie on your side while sleeping. Immediately after moving, this incredible wave of relief fills my body. I'm no longer afraid. I decide to call my mom for help. There's no way I'm getting up. The light switch is too far away. I try to yell help, but I can't speak for some reason. I try different sounds. Maybe I can say something specific. I try this until a sound escapes my mouth. I scream repeatedly. Nothing. I think to myself, screw it. I run to the switch light. I turn it on and sit down on the floor. It's over. I think that was some type of sleep paralysis, but I've never heard of being scared of something you can't see or hear. I just sense. Nothing else really happened to me after that. My earliest memory I have is from a nightmare I had when I was four. I had weird dreams like how one time I dreamt I cried on the floor for days until a, a group of men shushed me and then the dream ended. However, this one stuck with me the most. It was one of those long dreams out of a story, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. I was woken up by nightmares in the dreams. It was weird, but essentially I woke up and looked out my window. There was a car and I saw several people come out of the car. They wore colored masks. I guess they saw me. They ran towards my door. I ran to my mom in the living room and told her not to open the door. She told me I was overreacting and opened the door. 
She got stabbed, and a guy took her, threw her at me. I bolted and ran back to my door, jumped the fence and ran to a house begging for them to let me in. An old woman opened up the door and let me in. I was happy, and I felt safe. She said she would make me cookies, and I said sure. Then the guys came back and started ripping her apart, so once again I ran. But at that moment I woke up. I didn't want the dream to end, so I tried going back to sleep. It worked, and I was back running. Just running. That was the rest. I was stuck in a black void. All of a sudden, I was in a room with the guys. They were laughing and joking with me. I remember feeling uncomfortable and just laughed with them out of fear. One of them stood up and stabbed me. Then I woke up in a sweat. Not the greatest memory of my past, I guess. More of the story. That the dream is weird. Don't go back to it. I was about 8 years old when this happened to me. It was 10 p.m. I was playing with my dad in a tiny park near my grandparents' house. We were about to leave until suddenly I heard something from behind some nearby trees. Hello. The voice sounded like a 7 year old's. Without thinking much of it, I said hello back until I realized how creepy it was that a kid like me was behind some trees saying hi to random people. I asked my dad if he heard the voice. He denied it. On my way back to my grandparents' house, someone threw a tiny pebble to my head. Hey, who's there? I said. Then I heard the voice again. Hello. I asked my dad if he heard it that time. The same answer as before. We kept walking till we finally got to the house. We had to leave because I had school next day. Me and my family got into the car and left. I pulled my head through the window to enjoy the wind on the way home. I was enjoying the wind until my dad stopped at a red light with my head still hanging from the window. I heard the voice one last time. Goodbye. My dad still doesn't believe me when I try to tell him the story. My parents took me hiking once when I was four or five. We found this old ass cabin that looked like it was a hundred years old. They decided to go inside. I came in with them. I looked inside a hole in the floorboard, and I swear in my life I saw eyes looking back at me. They didn't blink. They just stared. I didn't know what to think, so me being the galaxy brain kid that I was, just shut and just didn't say anything about it. I had mostly forgotten it until my parents told me that the cabin was burnt down, and no one knows why. I don't know if I saw a dead body, some animal, or... An old-ass doll. Whatever it could be still there, under the rubble of the burnt-up cabin. Oh boy, do I have some stories. According to my mom, when I was a wee lad about four years old, I used to suddenly scream and cry in fear in the middle of the night. I told my mom it was because a man was always trying to scare me when I was sleeping. My mom, grandma, and sister have had some weird involvements with spirits. Mama assured that she could see spirits when she was a child. Because of this, she brought me back to my grandma's house and tried to do some spirit channeling. As she suspected that an evil spirit was playing tricks with me for its own enjoyment. Can't remember much about it, but apparently grandma channeled the spirit and was threatening to curse me and my mom. The next day, I came running to my mom, saying that a weird man was in the doorway. She went to see him and discovered that it was another spirit, a black man with an elongated neck. He told her that he was a slave that got executed by hanging, and that the spirit was tormenting me was, apparently, his slave master. Things are foggy after that, but the information was used by my mom and granny to make some sort of right to ban the slave master. Suddenly, the spirit went away, and I never had any experiences like that ever again. Another thing happened during Easter. Me and my mom went to see my sister and her friend to invite them to go visit Grandma the next day. When we were leaving, my sis said, Can we please be careful during the trip? I had a dream last night where me, her friend, and you, Mom, were inside a car, and we crashed. I don't know why BBG, good old handsome unlucky me, wasn't in it. 
The next day, we picked Sis and her friend, and we got on the road. During our trip, going to Granny and coming back to the city, the car was making some weird noises, and my mom thought something was wrong with the tire. We did make it back home safe. The next day, my mom went to see a car repairer to examine our car and find out what's wrong with it, only for him to find nothing wrong at all. She then went to another car repairer that she personally knows and keeps in contact with in case our car has a problem. When she arrived, the repairer just looked at the car and said that something was wrong with one of the tires. It turns out three out of the four of the tire's bolts were crooked, loosening the tire. That basically meant that the tire should have gone out, making the car crash. Thankfully, he replaced them for free. To make things weirder, my mom said that back at Granny's house, she saw a spirit twice. It did nothing. It just was there. Well... This was long as hell, but I feel better being able to tell these misadventures somewhere. If you're reading this, Goose, thanks, but I can't forgive you for insulting our Lord and Savior Garfield. I'm sorry. It's a terrible comic, I'm sorry, but it really is. Thanks for the story, though. It was around 10.30pm at night, and I was half asleep. While I was watching YouTube, my closet door swings out very powerfully and I freak the fuck out. Note, I was like 9 years old at the time. I go upstairs to my mom and dad's room crying and freaking out and my dad doesn't care. So, so my mom brings me back into my room and tucks me back into bed. A few years later, I found out my house used to have a family with a very sick relative who stayed in the home. Sad to say that that person died about a month before we moved in, and every other person who lived in my house after that had reported to see the same thing in the very same room. So every night I stare at my closet thinking about that traumatic experience I had. I had a dream that people were killing themselves in the street. There was one woman on a sidewalk kneeling on her hands and knees with people surrounding her and cheering. Some guy with no shirt and super long hair came up next to her and said, Here, this is how you do it, then proceeded to bash his forehead into the sidewalk several times. The scariest true thing that happened to me was when I was 13. Our parents had a small cabin up in the woods. One night when we were staying over, the weather was very cloudy and thunderous. Lightning filled the sky like a movie. Every couple of seconds you'd see the sky fill up with light, so I wanted to check it out because of how badass it was, so I decided to just go outside. It was close to midnight and everyone was asleep, but I felt safe because there was usually enough traffic around you, so you don't really feel like anything was going to happen. I go outside in the front yard and I close the door. I turn around and see a black image right in front of me, and I notice that it moved and started staring at me. I thought to myself that it must just be my dad for some reason checking out the storm, so I call out to it. Dad? I said. And the figure in a deep, dark tone said, No. I choked, but gathered up enough courage to ask, Who are you? And he replied, I'm Frederick. I'll never forget the damn name. I replied in a scared, barely confident tone, You have to leave. Then what scared me to death, he replied angrily, This is my house. Scared shitless, I managed to get inside and close the door. I see him stand up. Just like a movie, I tried locking the door. Our cabin was built in the 50s and had a janky lock, so I was shaking to try and lock it and managed to lock it, which felt like took hours, but I was able to do it. I see the figure stand up and go to the side yard. I woke my parents, telling that I saw a man walk around outside and repeatedly told them that I wasn't sleepwalking because at the time I tended to sleepwalk, but they got up and my dad went to the other side of the house to get a defense weapon, which comedically was a walking stick. He sees a small light coming from the door, inspecting the inside of the house. He turned on all the lights outside and ran out the door. The last thing I remember seeing was an elderly drunk homeless man who apparently was looking for a place to crash. My dad told him to just keep walking down the street just to get him out of there. We called the cops and the cops caught him urinating in the bushes. He got arrested for public urination, but not for attempting to break in. I'm not a great storyteller, but this really happened, and 
I will never forget his name. Frederick. Okay, Goose. Now listen, when I was a kid, I woke up from the top of the bunk bed me and my brother shared, and I saw death at the open closet slash hallway, and I climbed so fast down my bed and into my parents' room, which were on the same floor, and I screamed that death was coming for me. Parents would tell me that I was just dreaming the whole thing, but I don't buy that. By the way, as a kid, I always heard a woman person call out my name, and my brother would also hear it, but it was always my name. Cousin, brother, and I were digging in the dirt when we found this smiley face that glowed like burning charcoal, and throwing water at it did not seem to stop it from glowing. I vaguely remember my life passing me by before I became sentient slash conscious and aware of myself. That was a weird feeling, not gonna lie. Also might be my first memory. Might as well. This story relates more to a family matter than me specifically, but I'm still involved. When I was little, around 3-4, to four, I used to live in Tennessee with my mom and my dad. My dad at the time was on a mission trip with our local church, along with my mom. I was being watched by their friend at the time. When they got back, they had also brought a souvenir, which was a small stone statue. We didn't know at the time, but essentially it was an idol of one of their false gods that they worshipped within the area. A lot of satanic stuff was known to occur there, hence the mission's trip. So, when they arrived home, stuff instantly just wasn't right. They refused to tell me the whole story and everything that happened, but here's some minor things before I get to my main and arguably most traumatizing part of the story. Note that these events may not be in chronological order. All of this occurred once my dad, who was training to be a pastor for a Baptist church, left for an unrelated business trip. Lights would constantly flicker on and off, no matter the time of day, and at one point when my mom was driving down the street to arrive home at night, every light within the house was rapidly turning off and on at random. She turned around instantly, not wanting me to be put at risk, seeing as how I was very young. No one was in the house at the time. At one point, there was objects thrown at walls, mainly things on the same shelf as the statue. When we did realize the cause, and after my dad got home, we threw out the statue in the garbage to have it taken away. For the first time since we moved there, the garbage truck never arrived. For about three days each night, we'd all sleep in one bed as a family due to loud bangings from outside the house. Once the truck came and took away the garbage, everything stopped. Now for my main experience that I still remember despite me being four or five years old. I was in my bed, looking at the doorframe when three human-like figures approached me, though they had no human features, being completely black. Think sleep paralysis, except they actually moved towards you. And there's three figures. After that, I remember screaming and my parents running into my room, right after I screamed. From what they told me, I had a few scratches and was repeatedly saying the cat scratched me through tears despite us not owning any pets at the time. My dad told me he knew something was wrong before I had even screamed. Simply getting out of bed and running to my room once he started running was when I screamed. This was the same night we threw out the statue. Banging started the next night until the garbage truck eventually arrived as described earlier. I don't really expect many to believe this since a lot is based in religious things such as spiritual warfare, but from the way my parents act when discussing the situation, I can say with 100% certainty that at the very least, something did happen. Though all I remember is the whole shadow event and crying about cats. I'm also pretty sure that it's what sparked my fear of cats though. That's more of a joke, if anything. Anywho, that's my story. I'ma go enjoy some minty tacos now. Not kidding, I have tacos sitting on a plate next to me. Hey, uh, minty taco shirt, coming soon. Hopefully, I guess. I posted this on Tumblr, but I'll repost it here. Up until my younger sister was born, I had frequent nightmares, night terrors slash sleep paralysis. I don't know. It was probably because once she was born, I couldn't sleep much, lol. I remember a few, but this one scared me the most. I woke up in the middle of the night, but I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I, I looked towards the corner of my room near my closet. My heart kept pounding to the point that I swear I heard it. In that corner stood two women, naked and covered in blood. 
Their hair covered their faces, but I knew they were staring at me. One moved over and opened her mouth, and the next thing I knew, I was running to my parents' bed, begging them to wake up. My mom remembers this and swears she'd never seen me so terrified. It's funny, because I can remember everything about my room. The sheets had Winnie the Pooh on them, I had an aerial nightgown, and we painted my room blue to look like it was underwater. I was obsessed with the Little Mermaid. I remember my room was messy because I hadn't cleaned it. I remember the Tinkerbell poster on my wall, the flower-shaped lamp on my desk, my orange teddy bear laying next to me. I even remember the two women, but I can't remember what their faces looked like or what the other woman did. This memory slash dream has always haunted me, and I still don't know why I had it. This isn't my story, but my friend's. It was his sophomore year of college, and he was friends with a girl who was known to be a little controlling. One day, this girl, who I'll call Jane, and another friend, I'll call her Claire, were hanging out in Jane's dorm. After a while, Claire's boyfriend showed up, and she told Jane she had to leave. Jane started flipping out, saying that Claire cared about her new boyfriend and her friend, and that if she leaves, she'll never forgive her. Claire was picking up on some mega weird vibes, so she stood by her excuse and started heading for the door. It was at that point that Jane said, if you leave, I'll kill you, and pulled out a knife. Naturally, Claire started freaking out and tried to get her to put the weapon down. Jane just kept shaking her head and saying that she knows where Claire lives. She knows where my friend, who told me the story, lives, and that she'll kill them both. Claire was desperate to leave now and told Jane that she would bring her boyfriend back up to hang out with them. Jane made her promise that she'd come back, and after giving her word, Claire dipped out of the building as fast as possible and didn't look back. When campus officials came to check in on the girl, she was supposedly laying in the center of a pentagram and thrashing wildly. Several restraining orders were issued. Here's a story. I used to work weekend nights and my wife would always be home alone with her car in the driveway. One particular Saturday I was at work and my wife happened to go out with her friends. Her friend picked her up, so her car was still in the driveway. When I got home at 1am, the power to the house was out. I went to check the circuit breaker and saw that the padlock on it had been cut. I promptly went inside and called 911. Here's the conclusion I've come to, though I'm open to alternatives. Someone had been watching us for a while and knew our habits. That Saturday, they saw her car in the driveway and my car gone. They cut the lock and threw the circuit breaker. This would have baited her outside. She would have been outside with the front door unlocked and quite vulnerable. I bought a nice bottle of wine for her friend and a shotgun for the house. One of my earliest nightmares is that I was in my home being forced to watch a video of a dirty crack house almost room and a waiting for something. I don't know who forced me, but I was there, unable to stop watching, and I was hearing screams of horror and pain coming out of the other rooms. I was afraid of what was going to happen to me, and scared to think what was going on in the other room. When I was in ninth grade, there was this girl that would see when I went back to pick my sister up from the bus stop. I spoke to her once, and ever since I can't seem to get rid of her. She always seems to know where I am, and when. Like I'll be minding my business, and she'll be in the back obscured, but watching. I've even moved neighborhoods, and I've seen her there too. I need help. Thanks for reading by the way, love your vids. Thanks. I have a million personal scary stories, but this one is a doozy. So this was a couple years back, right? I was in like freshman year of high school, so I was a wee lass, kind of. On this night, my stepdad left to go to work at 9 as usual. We heard him exit the door and everything from upstairs where me, my mom, and my brother were watching TV. A few minutes pass and eventually it gets to commercial break, so... I decided to run downstairs and get some snacks before the show comes back on. When you first go downstairs, you overlook a hallway and you have to make a turn to get into the kitchen, so I was going about doing my business and as I'm standing in the middle of the hallway, I hear a rustling in the kitchen. 
Obviously, I'm freaked out. I don't know what to do. Though, after a good minute, I eventually decide to be a tough guy and choose fight over flight. Who's there? I say in my lowest, toughest voice. I don't get a response. Only heavy footsteps. My heart jumps out of my chest. I thought I was going to die. I hastily but clumsily ran up to the stairs on all fours and entered the TV room before shutting the door. My mom joked about my behavior. Not paying any mind, I go up to her and whisper, Someone's in the house. My voice trembling, she shrugs it off, suggesting that it was her dog. Oh, it was probably Mandy. But then she looks down to see the layering in front of the couch. I had never seen such a look of horror in her eyes. She tells me and my brother to stay put as she scopes things out. I tell him to follow me into my room, which was the next room over. I grab my knife from behind my dresser and we wait. It felt like ages until we heard our mom laughing downstairs. I sneakily check from the top of the stairs to hear her and her stepdad chatting. Apparently he came back inside without any of us hearing. Sneaky bastard. My story is short, so prepare yourself for a short and probably boring and all over the place story. I was young when this happened, around seven or nine years old, and I really hate the dark and or being closed up in dark rooms. I'm a bit of a claustrophobic. I was so used to having my TV on as a nightlight because every time I sat in the dark for too long, I would start to hallucinate and see scary stuff that no one else saw, like shadow figures and big spots of black, etc. But I never saw shadow figures in a human form. It was a school night when it happened. I had been up past midnight and laughing loud in my room. And I ended up staying up until my dad went to work. But before he left, he came in my room to scold me, telling me to go to bed. Hand on my light switch, about to turn it off. I told him I was afraid of the dark and he said, As big as you are, you shouldn't be scared of anything. Me being chubby, I took slight offense to that. But instead of listening to me, he did it anyway. And to make it worse, he closed my door. When he did that, I instantly felt uneasy, and my breathing started to increase. This story happened in Mexico while I was visiting some family. They had a separate small house for guests to stay in. The house was old and made out of concrete blocks with one large window located at the front of the house and a small one in the bathroom. The house had three rooms. The main room was a kitchen, and then the bathroom behind it. Then, there was a bedroom. There were no windows in it, and only one door that locks when closed. There was also two beds separated by a wall, as well as a closet on the other side of the wall that had a sliding door. The house was owned by my deceased uncle. Some of his things were still in it, like pictures and cologne, stuff like that. It was like he was still staying there. I was traveling with my older brother and his wife. He chose the bed in front of the room, and I chose the bed behind the wall, separating the room. While we were settling in, my sister-in-law decided to put on some of her clothing in some drawers. At the time, we didn't think much of it. Later that day, we decided to nap for a little bit, and... I think when we woke up, the door was closed. Like I said before, the door when closed locks by itself. Well, the door was closed and we couldn't get out. Since the room was made out of concrete blocks, there were barely any cell service. My sister-in-law was trying to look for a key and I thought I'd help to look too. When I reached for a drawer, I had the intense feeling of stop, like something had told me not to do something without hearing the actual words. I didn't say anything about it if I kept it to myself, mostly because I didn't want to be teased. Long story short, my little cousin, she's like five or six, went through the small window to get us out. The front door was also locked. We all just thought that the breeze just closed the door or something like that. When this was happening, everyone felt an unsettling feeling. This feeling was the first warning that would escalate to something worse. There was times where I couldn't be with my cousin because they would go drinking or had adult times. I was 15 at the time. When this stuff was happening, I'd go back to the house and play some 3DS games. One night, I was laying in my bed and all of a sudden I felt uncomfortable, like someone was staring at me. 
and like that I heard the closet door slide shut. I called for my brother and no one answered. I was too scared to look for myself. I just ignored it and put my earbuds in and continued to play more games, but underneath it all I felt unsettled and uncomfortable. Another night of drinking for my brother and his wife and I decided I'd stay in the main house instead for fear of what happened last time. I stayed up playing and saw my brother arrive. I continued for about two hours later. They came running to the main house. When I saw them, they were absolutely terrified. When they calmed down, they told me what happened. They walked in, got ready for bed, and tried to fall asleep. My brother had an uncomfortable feeling like someone was staring at him in the darkness, so did his wife. They both checked on each other and decided to turn on the light. Both of them were very religious and decided to pray. They prayed in English. First, nothing seemed to happen. The uneasiness stayed. Then, my brother realized that they should pray in Spanish, since they were in Mexico. He started to pray out loud in Spanish, and as he was reciting, the feeling of uneasiness grew stronger and stronger, until the room itself couldn't handle it. The light burst, darkness consumed the room once again, and my brother and his wife sprinted out there like this is what it wanted to happen. We later discussed the events that led to the light being demised. The moment I first felt the feelings of uneasiness when I reached for the drawer, my sister-in-law putting clothes in drawers that weren't hers to begin with, my brother feeling like someone was watching him as he sleeps when I heard the closet door to the first night when the door shut. That spirit wanted us out and clearly showed us. This story might not be thrilling as others, but it's the best I got. Also, all these were real things that happened. Hey, no problem, man. I thought that was interesting. I frequently have sleep paralysis and I suffer from nightmare syndrome, so I have pretty much night terrors and stuff. Also, I don't dream in color. My dreams are completely in black and white no matter what happens in them. So just remember that. A lot of times before I head to bed, I always feel like I get pulled by the feet or arms, which jolts me up constantly. I have a very detailed dream journal with sketches and drawings of what I've seen or things I've felt. I like being able to use that stuff for inspiration. I think my scariest experience was when I was a bit younger and I had just actually fallen into a dream. I found myself in a cavern with a heavy smog just floating around. I was walking through this cavern and suddenly felt a presence behind me, or like someone was watching me. Of course, you aren't supposed to ever turn around when you get the feeling of being watched, but me being a wee lad and not being the brightest person, I did just that and was greeted by a massive cliff, and off on the far side of that cavern was this massive unblinking eye looking directly at me. I felt as if it was talking to me without actually moving a mouth. I can't recollect what it said, nor do I think it was in any language I ever knew, but whatever it said gave me quite the spook. Usually, when things get bad in dreams, I close my eyes in the dream and repeat something akin to, you aren't real, I am real, which usually solves it. Instead, though, it said that it was real. Now, you don't really often get that reaction from something in your dream, but Afterwards, my head was filled with the sort of screaming that you know, really bad stuff. I awoke with a start, all sweaty, so I decided to get a drink of water. I have a problem with dark spaces. Even to this day, I'm almost 20. I don't do well in the dark alone. Never know what's beyond your sight, but I digress. I was going to get a drink of water and wash my face with some cool water in the sink. When I opened the bathroom, I wasn't greeted by normal bathroom in my house. Instead, it was a deep pit of blackness, darker than any shadow. So being me, I instantly felt something was wrong and knew something was going to go wrong. I grabbed the bathroom door and tried to shut it, pulling it closed as hard as I could, almost getting there but failing. In the end, I didn't succeed and tried to run, eventually being held down and dragged into the bathroom by a force stronger than me. I then awoke again on my couch, the place I had actually fallen asleep on. I knew I was awake because I could hear my own voice. If you can't hear yourself talk, you're in your dream. That's how I always know if I'm dreaming or not. That's how I usually figure it out. So I actually went and 
got a drink and washed my face off because I was pretty scared and don't want to go back to sleep. When I got back to the couch, I put my cover over my head and lay her belly down, resting my face on my folding arms. When something happened, I'll never forget. Without ever closing my eyes or feeling like I was asleep, I felt something lift up my back. It pulled me up and up and up, through the house and into a portal. Through that portal, I saw windows passing me, like looking into your memories. I saw old friends, old lovers, lots of sad and happy things. Slowly, the memories got more and more frightening until eventually I kicked whatever was carrying me and it dropped me right back into my body. That's what it felt like, as if my soul was just flung right back into my mortal form. All in one night that happened. A few years ago, me and my friends were out trick-or-treating. I think we were in sophomore year. It was real late into the night and everyone was basically done handing out candy and the night was dying down. We were heading back to my friend's house to finish off the night, eat candy and watch some horror movies or something. We saw a house that had all the lights off instead and a bowl full of candy on the porch. The driveway was short. There was a large bush to go to the right of. We started walking up the driveway and around the middle we heard something coming from the same direction of the bush. It sounded like something growling and moaning. My friend went over to the bush to take a look. He thought it was someone ready to scare us and run off. When I looked back at the house, there was a man standing in the doorway. He wasn't doing anything. He was just staring at us. I couldn't make out a lot of his face because the only light was the porch light. He looked old and decrepit, though. At first, I thought he was annoyed that two teenagers were at his property in the dead of the night. As I said, the driveway was short, so we were pretty close to him. I looked at the man and said, I'm sorry, my friend thought he lost something in your bush. We'll be going. After I said that, the guy started loudly and incoherently rambling and pointing at the bush. My friend ran over to me. We gotta go right now. And booked it down the road. I followed soon after him, wanting to get as far away from the situation as possible. Now that I look back on it, it's likely the old guy was just mentally ill, but ever since, my friend never told me what he saw in that bush. We don't talk much anymore, unfortunately, but I've asked a few times. It seems like he wants to keep whatever he saw shut away. Maybe it's just for the best that he does. I used to work at an old Catholic school for a summer job as a janitor. One day, my supervisor told me to clean the basement, which was very large and filled with toys, bikes, and old record players. I decided to play some oldies on one of the record players that worked, and the second I walked away, I heard children laughing. Not sure if it was from the record or from the basement itself. I shrugged it off and moved a couple of bikes. When I was done with the bikes, I turned around because one of the records ended, but when I did, the record was playing on a loop by itself. I turned off the record player and was going to go back to work, but the moment I turned around, all the bikes were back in the position they were in, and I heard the laughing again, this time more prominent. I bolted it out the door, but when I shut off the lights, the red exit sign glowed, and I swear I saw two little silhouettes of some kids standing in the glow. I lied to my supervisor and said the basement was totally clean. Later on, he told me that the basement was extremely haunted. When I was around four years old, I had to be alone at home until my babysitter arrived because my parents were at the other side of the countryside visiting my sister in an eating disorder facility. I had to be alone for over one or two hours once I remember hearing a voice that came from inside my house, but I was supposed to be alone, so as a curious little girl, I was... I followed. I followed the voice all over my house. The voice seemed to come from my bedroom. I opened the door and I saw a young boy. He started talking to me and kept asking me questions like, How is mom doing? Is she happy with her new husband? Does my sister's name know me? Obviously, I was confused, but he treated me nicely, and since then, I always used to play or talk with him until my babysitter arrived. But 
When my sister got out of the facility, I stopped seeing him at all. I was sad, and I told my mom about him. Obviously, she was confused, yet when I told her the questions he asked me, she looked completely terrified. She was completely pale and almost in tears, so she asked me how does this boy look like. I told her that he looked exactly like my sister. Then my mother told me that before my dad, she had another husband and got pregnant with twins, but this man was very abusive and he punched her in the belly before she gave birth. My sister was fine, but the other baby, the boy, was pretty bad. He died in the next few days after that, and now I sometimes see the mysterious boy looking at me, smiling, and I am 100% convinced that that mysterious boy is in fact my dead brother. It was Halloween, my 8th grade year. There was a huge Halloween party at the richest kid's house and everyone was there. The hottest girl in our grade was coming over, so one of my friends, we'll call him Dean, went and hid in the bushes with a clown mask and a chainsaw which he'd removed the chain from. He jumped out and scared her and she was terrified. Later that night, we decided we wanted to spook the girls a little more, so we all went outside and started walking. We told them that we were going to take them to see something cool, but in actuality, we just wanted to terrify them. As we walk farther and farther from the rich part of town and closer and closer to the not-so-good area of town, even we were getting chills a little bit. We tried to shake the feeling that we were being watched, but we couldn't really seem to get it off our chest. After checking the time, one of my friends realized that he was going way too far and needed to get home soon. He started texting his brother to come home and get him, but then we saw a pair of headlights from the distance. He assumed it was his brother and walked over to the curb when a solid white van with a masked driver pulled up. The back door slid open and a man with a painted face clawed at my friend and he was unable to pull him in fast enough. They sped off. Terrified, we all dispersed and hid into different bushes and shrubs, honestly, pretty selfishly, and proceeded to run home after we felt safe. I had a dream that I was in a nursery home with no doors or windows. Imagine the back rooms, and there was an old woman with a white sleeveless short dress following me around and saying hello repeatedly. When I turned around to walk away, her neck and tongue extended to the link of an arm, and she dug her tongue into my ear. That shocked me so much that I woke up grasping my ear and doing the motion of pulling something out of my ear with my arm. I used to work at a knockoff Chuck E. Cheese with bounce houses and a few arcade games that was really haunted. One day, when I was by myself getting ready to open the place up for the day by flipping the brakes on the bounce houses and slides and stuff, when I was leaving the maintenance room out of the corner of my eye, I saw a small boy staring from the crack of the break room. When I turned around towards the door, it slammed shut. I slowly went to the door and opened it and nothing was out of place. I then went to the front desk to get as far away as I could from the break room and to check if I forgot to lock the front door back uh, after I got there. I didn't forget. Five, ten minutes go by and then I hear another door violently slam shut, but it slammed shut several times. I jumped up and tried to check the party room it came from, but the door was wedged almost shut from the trash can that was supposed to be on the other side of the room. I didn't really know what to do. So I just turned on every light in the building and didn't leave the front desk unless I absolutely had to. I had a nightmare where I was in my house, tied to my bed and being watched over by a tall figure. It whispered, you're a pretty one, while smiling. Its teeth were white and its smile was long. I tried screaming but no sound would leave my mouth. My door opened and the creature said, it's time, my pretty, and I heard a sound of something crying in the darkness beyond my door. It was me. I looked beaten. I was missing one of my arms, and, and I, from what I could make out, I was horrified, and the creature grabbed the crying me and started to eat the version of me. The sounds were gruesome, and second me was crying louder. The creature finished and started to cut into my body so deep that it reached the bone, smiling and staring into my eyes while I started to cry. 
The creature opened its mouth, revealing an infinite amount of razor teeth, and said, Be happy. Smile. I will make you feel better. And then started to get closer to my face. I woke up, though, literally fucking horrified of what the hell I just dreamt of. One night at around 10 or 11 p.m., I was walking home from my friend's house to my own after having spent quite a long time there. Our houses are just a block away, so it didn't seem too bad, even though I'm really iffy about being alone at night. Anyway, once I left his house, I decided to head the opposite direction from his house because the lights on the street were dim and I didn't want to risk anything happening to me, so I went around the corner to get the main street that led to my street. As I was walking down the street, I had a brisk pace just to get home faster. And once I hit this one house with a big fence, a car parked at the other side of the street turned on and sat there for a second. I thought to myself, okay, that's creepy, but it's probably a coincidence, like he's about to leave right now. However, as I walked and kept an eye on him, he immediately made a U-turn onto my side of the street and slowly began to follow me. At this point, I was afraid because he wasn't speeding up. I knew he was waiting for me. I kept walking up until I got behind a larger car so he couldn't see me. And then I turned around and began walking back the way I came in and attempted to seem to like I forgot something and maybe see if he was actually following me. Well, this guy went forward a bit, realized I wasn't there and then began to reverse so he could see me again. At that point, I fully knew this guy was going to do something to me. So then I turned around again and just booked it back to my house, all the while making sure he didn't follow me. I didn't get a clear look at his face due to it being dark and his headlights were on, but I think he knew that I knew what he was doing, so he didn't pursue me further. When I got home, I called the cops to tell them what happened, but nothing came of it. Still kind of creeps me out to this day. This happened to me about a half a year ago. It was 2 a.m. and I was getting ready to sleep. As I was slowly falling asleep, I heard my brother and father talking as they went up the stairs, which were near enough to my room that I could hear people going up or down the stairs. I thought it was odd that my dad was up this late, but I assumed he was awakened by my brother. Oddly enough, I couldn't understand what they were saying, although I was barely conscious, so... As I heard them finish their climb up the stairs, I heard my brother talking to me from the entrance to the bathroom, which had two doors, one connected to my room and the other to the main room, and he mostly entered the room that way. He continued talking, yet I couldn't understand what he was saying. At the time, I was just hoping he'd leave me alone so I could sleep. Then I heard him coming closer until he was behind me. My eyes were shut the whole time, so I couldn't see anything. I figured he was just checking if I was asleep, so I planned on turning around and jumping at him, screaming to scare him. But once he felt like he was right behind me and I was ready to pounce, I suddenly got this horrible feeling that the thing behind me wasn't my brother. Then I noticed he stopped talking. Instead, I heard the faint ringing of a bell, which got louder and louder, until it felt like the bell was ringing from inside my skull. At this point, I had my eyes open, but I couldn't see anything, since I was on my side and the thing was behind me. I'm kind of iffy on this, but when the bell ringing intensified, I felt something brush up against my ear. When the full horror of the situation hit me, I tried to move and scream for help, but I couldn't even move my lips, save for barely mouthing the word help. But then I realized that I probably was experiencing sleep paralysis. As I've heard stories about it before, once that dawned on me, the bell stopped ringing and the presence behind me disappeared. I stayed laying there for a few minutes, paralyzed by fear more than anything else. And I got up, scanned my room for anything that seemed off, but everything was completely normal. But I was still terrified. So I went to check on my brother and found him still up and asked if he came to my room recently, to which he replied no. The thing that scared me the most was that in the sleep paralysis stories I've heard, 
people see something, but I didn't see anything, only heard the bell and the voice. <laughs>